Good morning. My name is Hugh Forrest. I am the Chief Programming Officer at South by Southwest. I'm incredibly excited to be introducing the first ever edition of South by Southwest online sessions. We've worked very hard on this content. We've got some great stuff for you today and in the weeks ahead. I think you're in for a real, real treat. For today's first ever edition, our guest is author and psychotherapist Lori Gottlieb. She is the person behind the mega best-selling book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. I read this book it, over Thanksgiving. I loved it. I loved it enough that I bought about three dozen copies for various colleagues at South by Southwest. I know that they enjoyed reading the book also. In addition to her clinical work, Lori writes the Dear Therapist column for The Atlantic. She also writes for various other publications. You can see her byline frequently in places such as The New York Times. This morning, she will be in conversation with the actress Julia Sweeney. Julia was a cast member at Saturday Night Live from 1990 to 1994. More recently, Julia is the co-star of the Hulu series Shrill, as well as the Showtime series Work in Progress. Lori and Julia will be discussing many of the principles for Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. They'll be particularly discussing how these principles apply to our lives and our relationships in today's stay-at-home world. So this should be a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Before I turn it over to Lori and Julia, I'm going to give you my colleague, Danuka Pereira. Danuka is going to talk to you a little bit more about the platform Slido. Slido allows you to ask questions and therefore engage directly with Lori and Julia. Danuka, tell us more about Slido. Take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hugh. Hi everyone, I'm one of the senior conference programmers at South by Southwest. And before we get started with today's online session, I just wanted to remind you of a couple things. So at any time during the session, you can enter your questions for Lori and Julia through the Slido platform in front of you. That's right, you're looking at it right now. We will be reviewing and approving questions as they come in. And once questions are approved, you'll be able to see them and upvote the ones that you like the most. During the second half of the session, Lori and Julia will answer as many questions as they can. That's really all I got for now. So I'm excited to welcome Lori and Julia. Hello. Okay. Hello. 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 Together. <laughs> okay. I'm just, just they, they did our introduction, I guess. That was that pause. Is that what happened? Or are we about to do it? I think so. I think let's okay, chat. Yeah, we've been introduced. Um, okay. First of all, maybe you should talk to someone. It's such an incredible book. I love it so much. And I'm so excited about being a TV series. I hope it becomes one. I think it's really just a perfect template for a show. And I'm really looking forward to it. I, I'm really raw rawing about it. Cause I think um, it's not only is it interesting and you can kind of vicariously live through all these other people's problems <laughs> and maybe see a little of yourself, but it's just educational too about what therapy can do for people. And I think that's what I love most about your book is just going through again, all the things that therapy does to help people. Anyway, so thank you for yeah. writing this wonderful book. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And yes, I just saw the outline of the TV show. So it's being written oh, by did? the creators of the show, The Americans. Oh yeah. Our writing TV series. Um, and Eve Longoria's company is producing it. And um, it's it's very interesting to see your work translated through the lens of somebody else's mind, right? Onto the right. page. Um, it's really exciting. And did you consult with them? Like, are you, are you, did you have any back and forth with them while they were developing? Yeah, sure. okay. yeah definitely. Yeah, I mean, you know, they asked me a lot of questions like, what would happen in this situation or tell me about this and you know just lots of lots of things that i think you don't know unless you're a therapist uh you know right. and we really want it to be very realistic so and you know i think that so many of the portrayals of therapists in the media have been i think one of two things either sort of like the blank slate like the therapist right. who never talks right, right. um kind of the robot um, and the other one, which I think is more common is sort of like the therapist is like a train wreck, you know, they're like, right. you know, they're, they're just like a, a complete mess. Um, and neither of those really reflects what therapists are like. And so, um, you know, I always say about the TV show, just like with the book that it's, it's about a person who happens to be a therapist. It's not about therapists. 
that makes sense. Right. So it's, it's really about the human condition. And I think that's why I think the book has, you know, really resonated so widely is because even for people who would never step foot in a therapist's office, I think that people see themselves through other people's stories most clearly. You know, it's one thing if you say right. to someone, you're like this, or you do this, and you know, our instinct is to say, no, I'm not, I don't do that. But if you read about someone else and you say, oh, I'm kind of like that, or I kind of do that, or that's right. how I get in my own way. Um, you know, I think that, that we really, I think are revealed through other people's stories. Even though I think the, one of the biggest takeaways I got from your book personally is um, when you talked about how insight is the booby prize of therapy, because I feel, especially maybe as a writer, and I'm sure you feel this way too, but I think everyone's like this. You're like, oh, that's why I'm this way. Or, oh, I see myself there. And that, and you think that's the end of the road. It's the insight right. trying to do something. And really it's making the change based on your insight. First of all, making sure your insight's accurate making a change based on that insight and then sustaining the change based on that insight. And that's the heart, that's the crux of it. It isn't necessarily the insight. No, that's just the beginning. People think that yeah. that's the ultimate goal. That's just the beginning. I mean, in the book I go through, there's a, there's a chapter called how humans change. And it's about sort of the stages yeah. of change that we go through that, that we don't even realize, um, you know, are sort of happening in the background. And so sometimes people will come to therapy and, you know, someone will report, you know, oh, I got in that fight with my partner again. And now I know exactly why I did that. And I'll say, well, did you do something different? And they'll say, right. well, no, but I understand it now. And it's like, yeah, that's. Oh, that's that, that is step one. Because it you is know, a lot of people one. don't even do that. I mean, I think so many people are stuck in their version of the story that just yeah. even having the insight should be applauded in some way. But still, I love that phrase, inside is the booby prize. I, I just love that so much. All right, here's my biggest number one question for you. How did you prepare your clients and patients, clients, yep. for the book? Because I started thinking, I think you had to provide a year of free therapy to anyone who was your client <laughs> for the book to just deal with the fact that you had a book and that maybe parts of them had been made parts of others in this book like okay so yeah let me clarify that um because i think now and now everyone's going to be like i'm never going to therapy um so the people that i wrote about were not people that i was currently seeing because i felt like i couldn't go and do work with them and then write about them even if what i was writing about happened say five years earlier um, right. it, okay. it needed to be clean so so first of all there was never any question about am i writing about somebody that i'm currently working with no um and then I think the other thing was I didn't tell my current patients that I had written a book um, because I don't talk about my life outside of the therapy room with them unless right. there's something relevant to their lives and maybe something will come up. But really, you know, oh, wow. that's for them. And so, so just let them find out on their own. <laughs> well, that's what happened. So it's funny. This is interesting. Um, so when I when the book came Take out, last, me. <laughs> well, right when the book came out last April. I, I told people I was going to be out, you know, because I was going to go do book tour. And I said, I'm going to be out on such and such dates. And here's who's on call for me. And I'll see you on this date. And I didn't say why I was going away. Just like if I go on vacation, I never say where I'm going, or why I'm not going to be in the office. Um, and so uh, when I came back from my book tour, at that point, it sort of, you know, it, it got out there in a very public way. Yeah. And it had already, you know, like hit the New York Times list and all of that. And um, I came back and some people came into my office and they sat on the couch and they said, so I read your book, <laughs> right? So they'd heard about it. You know, I'd never said anything about it. And we had these really beautiful conversations about not so much about me. I don't think they were so interested in me and they read a lot about me in the book, but they were interested in our relationship because I, I write a lot in the book about how important that relationship is between the therapist and the client and how transformative it becomes. And right. so um, we, you know, gave them permission. You know, there's this point in the book where I say to my own therapist, do you like me? Right. You know, like I think everybody right. wonders, am I boring my therapist? Does my therapist like me? Does my therapist really care about me? And I think it was really, it gave them this opening, maybe in a way, even though I try to create the space in the room for that anyway, 
it gave them a space to talk about us and how what goes on between us is it's sort of like a laboratory. It's like a microcosm for what goes on between them and the important people in their lives outside of the therapy room. Right. So it really, it really was opened up the work that we do. Other people to this day, it's been a year since the book came out. Other people have never mentioned the book. And I find it really hard to believe that they don't know about it just because I'm their therapist. So if they see my name somewhere, it's not going to like, skip you know skip over their sort of consciousness right, right. um and so I, I made a very intentional decision not to bring it up because if for whatever reason I haven't heard about the book I don't want to be the person saying hey by the way have you heard about my book yeah. um, obviously you've heard I've <laughs> yes exactly um and you know but I think for those that I'm pretty sure have heard about it just because they consume the media that it's been in a lot um I have made the decision to wait for them to bring it up because I think it'll be a really interesting conversation about what was going on during that time where they felt like they didn't want to bring it up. Right. Because I feel like, I mean, fortunately for you and so deservedly, it's such a big presence, this book. It's such a big hit. And I mean, I loved Marry Him. I read that too. And, but this is really exponential, bigger impact on the popular culture, I would say. And it, it just, it seems like I would think if somebody wasn't bringing it up, that would be their issue. That would, that would be the issue with that person. How could they not know that this thing is up? Well, well, right. Well, right. Well, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think that, you know, the question is sort of, if they do know what, what are the, what do they imagine would happen if they brought it up? You know, what, what would happen to our relationship? What would happen? Why? You know, how does this play out in their lives outside too? Like, do they, for example, there's, there's a, a client that I have who really does not bring stuff up in her relationship with her husband. Like she just doesn't bring it up, even though so much is going on and, you know, she's gotten much better at it. And I wonder if at some point she'll, you know, this is the same process going on where the thing that prevents bringing up things with her husband is preventing her from bringing this up with me. Cause maybe she doesn't like the fact that I have a book out and maybe it's right. hard for talk about the fact that she's angry with me or she feels something different about me um, that's negative that she's afraid to talk about right I don't know yet well you know we'll see yeah that's a hard one about how you're supposed to think about your therapist I mean I've been in you know probably five or six times been in therapy and um and some were great and transformative and some really weren't whatever but it was always hard to manage my fantasy of, and, and as you deal with, with Wendell, like how much do you care to know and how much, like, I always felt like I didn't want to know anything. Like I actually, now that you say that, I could see myself being one of those people not mentioning it because I think our relationship is here. And I kind of think of you as this uber goddess kind of person that that, that has, doesn't even have any, you know, whatever, even though that's, that's inaccurate too. But um yeah, when you anyway. say you, I assume you mean your therapist. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. But it just reminded me, I had one therapist, actually Blanca, my first one, who was just a student. She was probably only a few years older than me, and she was one of the best people I've ever seen. And um, she got pregnant. But I remember she so prepared me. She said, I'm pregnant, which means over time, as the weeks progress, my abdomen will become larger and <laughs> like oh really is that what happens um okay I'm prepared now for that okay okay I knew I was gonna love your book as soon as I opened it up because the first quote and I have a question about it is this Richard Bentel quote about yeah. possibly adding happiness as a disorder into the books of disorders and the idea is that um it should be classified as a psychiatric disorder and included in future editions of major diagnostic manuals, blah, 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 because um, it's a statistically abnormal state, happiness, and it consists of a discrete cluster of symptoms in association with a range of cognitive abnormalities and probably reflects abnormal functioning of the central nervous system. Um, Okay, I love this so much because I think of this constantly. And so why did you put that in there? That's, I won't say what I think. Why did you put that in there first? Right, so that's sort of the epigraph to the book. And um, 
as people who have read the book know, I was originally supposed to be writing a book about happiness. Right. And, and I, I could not get myself to write that book because um, I felt that as I was starting out as a therapist, that happiness was beside the point. And by the way, I don't mean that we don't want to be happy. What I mean is that happiness as a byproduct of living our lives in a meaningful way mm-hmm. um, is what we all want. And I think that's why people come to therapy is, you know, what is, what is getting in my way? What are these, what are these ways that, what are these blind spots that I'm clearly not seeing? How do I navigate through the world more smoothly? How do I find purpose and meaning, which will, um, part of which will be about relationships? Um, you know, all of those questions. But happiness as the goal in and of itself is always a recipe for disaster. It's empty. It doesn't have anything girding it, right? And so um, when I was writing the happiness book, because I was under contract to write this book, it was, it was making me depressed. I mean, it was so ironic. <laughs> It was like, I called it the miserable depression inducing happiness because I, I, I felt like, like as I was writing about all the studies, it just felt so clinical to me. And what I felt I had the privilege of doing was going in and seeing the human condition every day. And people imagine that being a therapist is really draining. You know, how do you, how do you deal with hearing about people's problems all day? And I think it's so invigorating. I feel like what I see in that room are these moments where people, they make these microscopic changes that over time become transformative changes in their lives. And so I see people, you know, doing these heroic things, taking risks where they never did, being able to look at themselves in a different way. Um, I talk in the book about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion. I love that. Oh my God. The idiot compassion. That is going to go forever in my head. Right. So idiot compassion is what you get outside of therapy. It's what our friends do for us. You know, it's like, oh, this guy broke up with me and we say, he's a jerk, right? You know, or my boss did this. Oh, she's a jerk, whatever it is. Um, And you're right. Whatever it is, your friend is right. And that's idiot compassion because we know that maybe, um, you know, the reason the boyfriend broke up with her is because, you know, she always like snoops through his phone or, you know, whatever it is. Or the reason that this thing happened with the boss is because she really didn't do what she was supposed to do, or she doesn't get along with her coworkers or whatever it is. And it's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. Right. But we don't say that with idiot compassion. We know that about our friends because we know them pretty well. But also we're only hearing one side of the story. So maybe we don't know that about them because we're all unreliable narrators, right? I did a TED talk about this, how we're all unreliable. I love that TED talk. Two million plus views, by the way. Big Yeah, yeah. So so what happens in therapy is wise compassion, right? So it's where a therapist will hold up a mirror to somebody to help them to see themselves in a way that maybe they haven't been willing or able to. And that's what really helps people to transform. So what I'm doing in the room, I think, is so inspiring to watch people do something that's really hard, which is to take a look at yourself in a way that you're not going to do out there because everybody's like feeding you this idiot compassion. And so, you know, what happens when we get rid of our shame? What happens when we can look at ourselves without judgment and just say, oh, okay, I see something and this is not working for me. And what can I do differently? Or why do I do this? Right. Going back to the first step being insight. Why do I do this? And is this something, it's almost like a lot of people are acting out something that's historic, something from their past, but they're acting like it's going on in the present and it's not except in their minds. It's like wearing clothes that don't fit anymore. They don't realize that they're like wearing these old clothes. Right. Like, Change your clothes. Right. Like this is not actually happening in the present. But yeah. you think. There's, it's incredible the habit of mind, like a victim habit of mind or a defensive habit of mind. It's just amazing how much that can control your life and how useless it can become over time. Like you're really going farther and farther away from reality and you're creating your own reality. I mean, anyway, you know. Well, yeah, well, that's, those are the stories. I think we don't even realize that we're walking around with these stories in our heads. And the story might be, I'm unlovable. The story might be, um, you know, I can't trust anybody. The story might be nothing ever works out for me. Um, right. You know, whatever the story is, um, that that kind of shapes how we view every interaction that we have. I had this, I had, and we don't even realize these stories are going on. I, I had this patient 
And she was like so self-critical. And I think one of the things we don't realize is how unkind we can be to ourselves. Yeah. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. And she was so self-critical and she didn't realize it. So I said, I want you to write down every thought, you know, that you think about yourself in the course of a few days, just write it down so you can pay attention to these voices right. and come back and we'll talk about it. And she came back the next week and she had it all written down. She had done her homework and she started like to read and she said, I can't do this. I am such a bully to myself. And there were things like, oh, you made that mistake. You're so stupid. Right. Oh. You know, like that. And it's just like, we don't realize that we would never say that to a friend. And I don't mean in the idiot compassion way. I mean, we wouldn't actually think that about our friend. Right, our friend, right. that mistake, we wouldn't go, God, she's an idiot. We just think, right. oh yeah, she made that mistake. We all make mistakes like that. But we're so hard on ourselves. And people think that if they're not hard on themselves, that they won't be able to change. They feel like self-flagellation is the only way to get themselves to do something different. And what oh they don't God, realize yeah. is, Right. And what they don't realize is self-compassion is what you need. And self-compassion right. isn't a lack of accountability. Self-compassion is the prerequisite for accountability. That in order to be accountable, right. you have to be kind to yourself. And then you can hold yourself accountable in a way that will be helpful. But if you just self-flagellate, maybe in the moment it'll help you to change. Like, oh, don't do that or do that or whatever. You're, right. you're tossed. But it doesn't help in the long term. In fact, it holds you back. And also because you have to rebel against it. I mean, then you have to sneak around it. Like you, well, right. you know, like I feel that way. My big um, step forward this year has been in the world of eating and body image and weight and everything. And, you know, and I've been on diet since I was, you know, I could count. My mom had me counting calories because her fear of me being heavy and she was heavy, whatever. And it's only in the last couple of years I've for the first time let go of that like i'm just eat what i want and then whatever size i am i try to look as good as i can at that size and letting go of all that no 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 that's a bad thing to eat or you had a good day or a bad day just the mindset of it and this is a, this could be applicable to anything in your life well Maybe right you actually want to like oh you know what i notice is i don't feel good when i eat too much sugar so I guess, I, you know, like it, it comes at it from this other way. And I've found that that's very transformative in all kinds of issues in life. Right. So the language that we use, so you're using things like there are good foods and bad foods, right? That's the language right. that you use. Um, we do that with feelings too. There are good right. feelings, bad feelings. And then we think, well, if I'm feeling anxious, that's a bad feeling. If I'm feeling right. sad, that's a bad feeling. If you're feeling anger, that's a really bad right. feeling. And it's not, not, there's no, there's no sort of value judgment to our feelings. Our feelings are what make us human. And we don't, we, you know, we feel a range of, of things during the day, a range of emotions. And so I always tell people that feelings are like weather systems. They blow in, they blow out. Sometimes that's it's rain. That's not necessarily yeah. bad. Sometimes like we love the rain, right? It's beautiful. Right. Um, it helps us sleep. I love like hearing the rain on my roof and it helps me sleep. So rain isn't necessarily a bad yeah. thing, just like sadness or anxiety um, are not necessarily bad things. Our feelings are like a compass. They, they tell us what direction to go in. Right. They tell us what we want, even things like envy, right? So I always say to people, yeah. they try to like push down their envy. And I say, no, 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 follow your envy. It tells yeah. you what you want. So if you are feeling envy, it tells you about something in your life that you don't yet have. And so right. what steps you take to get your version of that thing that you want? If you're anxious, what is not working in your life? That's a clue. If we don't pay attention to our feelings, a lot of times we try to numb our feelings with, like we were talking about too much food or too much wine or too many hours on the internet. A colleague of mine said that the internet is the most effective short-term non-prescription painkiller out there, right? <laughs> so if we try to numb our feelings, right. we try to numb them, but numbness isn't the absence of feelings. Numbness is a sense of being overwhelmed by too many feelings. Right. And you can't make your feelings go away. You can pretend they're not there, but they'll come out in other ways. In you know, right. a short temperedness, in relational difficulties, in like all of these sort of addictions that we turn to for short term gratification. Um, and so when you actually feel your feelings, you say, oh, what is this anxiety telling me about what's not working? What is this sadness telling me so that I can make changes in my life? I like that. I, I've tried to say like your emotions is just information. That's, yes. It's information that you should pay it's attention to. Yeah. Right. Right. It's almost okay, like now I feel like we have to go to the questions. I'm seeing. Oh, so many okay. Questions. Let's do it. We have our questions too, Lori. 
okay um i'm gonna try to make this seem so beautiful and seamless here to show off to all the producers but i have to do <laughs> on my screen okay what would be your advice for people who are actively trying to find a therapist there are so many types styles etc that it can be overwhelming thanks that is such a great question because I think that people, what they do is they, they get a name from somewhere, maybe on the internet or maybe a friend recommended someone and they go in for a first session and they think like, I'm in therapy with this person. Right. No, I'm not in therapy with that person. It's a consultation. Think of it like a first date. It's like, you want to see what does it feel like to sit with this person? And then at the end of the session, say to yourself, how did I feel about that? Did I feel understood? Did I feel like this person kind of gets it? Whatever that means in the course of 50 minutes. Right. And if so, go back for a second session. That doesn't mean that's your therapist. It means you're going to go back for another session and you're going to see how it feels. And you're going to go back for several sessions. And then at a certain point, you're going to decide, is this the person that I want to keep working with? And then you're you know, really invested in that. But even then, you can always leave right? Or inevitably, like I said about the relationship being a microcosm for the relationships out there, if something comes up and you're like, oh, that was really, I didn't really feel good about that session or something happened in that session that I'm kind of thinking about and a little bit uncomfortable with, bring that up in the next session. The beauty right. of there, you get to talk about everything. Nothing gets swept under the rug. And so you learn so much about, like some people, if something goes, you know, in a certain way that they don't like in therapy, they just leave, you know, they ghost the therapist or they, right. they, they just, they're gone. Um, that doesn't help them. What helps them is to have a conversation, even if they decide, you know what, I don't want to work with this person. You learn something about showing up and telling your truth and saying, this was my experience and having a, con a hard conversation with somebody about it. There's something so liberating about being able to say, I had this experience. What was it like for you? Except I feel, I always feel like I have to go to therapy in order to have that conversation with a therapist. Um, like, like, but it's that's like the it work, I mean, that's so the work to do that. And, and going back, by the way, to the question that the, the person asked about, how do you initially even find the person to get in the room with? Um, I always say that if you have, if you know someone who's really getting a lot out of therapy and not the person who is constantly saying, my therapist said this, my therapist said that right. and right. improving it all. And like the therapist is their, is their life, right? right. The guru, that's, not yeah. the that's not the person. It is the person who you notice that like, they're really making changes in their life. And you're like, yeah. wow, kind of like, wow, what happened to you? And they're like, oh, I went to therapy. Ask them who their therapist is. Even if you don't want to go to the same therapist as that person, maybe it feels too close. Ask them to ask their therapist if they have any referrals for you. So I get that all the time. Like my clients will say, my friend wants to go to therapy. I feel really uncomfortable with my friend coming to my therapist. Um, can you recommend someone for that person? And I will do that. Yeah. Another way you don't know someone is just, is just you know, go on psychology today, do a Google search, and then right. really you won't know until you sit in the room with that person. I think it's real, for me, the best thing out of that is it's like a first date because you're either going to click with someone or not. And there have been a couple out of my six bouts of therapies um, where I stayed too long. It was like a relationship. I stayed too long. Like I knew in the third session, but I felt like I had to stay anyway, but I think I'm better now. So, okay. On to the next question. How do you feel about doing therapy remotely? Oh, I wanted to ask you this too. Um, how, uh, how do you feel about doing therapy remotely during this time of COVID-19 versus doing it in person is something missed by not doing it in person? Okay, so just today, I have a New York Times op-ed out about this exact topic. So go read the New York Times op-ed, but the short version, uh, you can read a thousand words of it. Um, but the, the short version is that um, I was talking about in the op-ed um, about how everybody's saying to me, isn't it really draining seeing people right now because you're hearing all these stories of you know loss and anxiety um, and it's such a hard time. And what I said is, I have never laughed so much with my patients. And what I mean by that is we are not laughing about the coronavirus, just to be clear, there's nothing funny about the coronavirus. But most people that I'm seeing right now need to find a private place to talk to me, right? Because normally they come right. in my office, you know, it's very <laughs> private. And so, you know, they've got their families around, they might have right. roommates there, whatever it is. And so they're either like, you know, in the <laughs> car, in their closet, oh, yeah. but mostly, 
I'm seeing people on their toilet seats in their bathrooms. Wow. Like, they, like they had to go to a private place and they went into the bathroom, they closed the door, they sat down. Very and metaphoric. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so um, it's interesting because, so wow. I had, there was, woman that I was seeing and she was sobbing about her mother it's in a nursing home and there was a case of COVID-19 in the nursing home she was so worried her mother was going to get the virus and die of the virus and she's sobbing about this and she leans back and and flushes the toilet by accident and it was this like <laughs> very fun moment and I did not laugh because you know I wanted to laugh but I thought this is really inappropriate I'm not going to laugh and, and then she said, you know, am I the only person who, who sees you, you know, who does like Skype sessions from, from the toilet? And I said, no, actually the toilet has become the new couch. And I immediately regretted making that joke because of what she had been talking about. It's a good and, joke, Laurie. But she laughed, right? She <laughs> laughed. And then, you know, laughter is contagious. And so I laughed. And at the end of the session, she said to me, you know, I really appreciated everything you said during the session, but you know what has comforted me, comforted me the most in a really long time is that we got to laugh together. And laughing reminded me of my former self before this virus. And it reminded me of the self that I'm going to have again when we come out of it. And we talked about the therapeutic benefit of laughter. And there's so much comedy that happens when you're doing you know, these online oh, yeah. sessions people and also I think the intimacy of seeing inside people's homes and them seeing inside mine yeah. and I think, you know just like I've heard about their kids or their spouses for a long time but I never knew what they looked like and now people are barging in you know and like I see that's these happened to me. that's happened to me right and I'm seeing yeah. these interactions in real time and I'm not just hearing about them or like cats are like crawling across the screen um you know people are putting on like a button down top during you know to have the session but I see their flannel pajama bottoms when they angle the camera the wrong way I mean it's just real life or I see like the tchotchkes that they have on their nightstands right um, there's an intimacy that I yeah. think and an intimacy of we're all in this together that we're all going through the same things right, right. um and so even though in my book I talk about how a colleague of mine had said that doing Skype sessions is like doing therapy with a condom on right because, I love that's a great line okay <laughs> right. And it's so true. You don't have, there's something different about the energy and the intimacy of being in the same space um, that you just can't replace. But I think yeah. there have been the unexpected benefits yeah. of during the pandemic of doing these sessions where there is a certain kind of intimacy that you don't get in the therapy room that I never had anticipated. And then there's also just the, the, the importance of, of laughter and comedy and, you know, the yeah. screen free the most inopportune moment and things like that happen. Yeah. My big fear is that I worked so hard on my look, my background, my lighting. I have special lighting. I know exactly the angle of my screen that now when people see me in real life, they're going to go, what? You're not that <laughs> beautiful. Okay. Yeah, I was really impressed. I was really impressed with like- No, I, work, I spent a whole Sunday, my husband and I, he was like, oh, this light over here. I have a bounce light over here. It's all artificial. Wow. Okay. Oh, okay. you look great, Julia. It works. <laughs> okay. Um, here we go for the next question. Um, can we be therapists for each other during this time without having to pay for a therapist? What are the yes. most important tips for doing this? That's a good one. Right. So, um, you know, the title of my book is maybe you should talk to someone and it doesn't necessarily mean maybe you should talk to a therapist. It means maybe we all need to talk more to each other. And this, of course, was written before anybody ever imagined there would be a global pandemic. Right. I feel like Talking to each other is so important. I have people who come into me and, and I see this, there's a difference also between men and women. Like I will see men will come into me and they will say, you know, I've never told anyone this before. And then I wait because I think it's going to be this big revelation. And they'll say something that feels so mild to me. And I feel so much compassion for them because I feel like, wow, they have like a partner that they love and they have friends and right. they have family. And they felt like, they, like in our culture, it's not okay for men to be vulnerable, even about things that don't even feel that vulnerable, say to me, right? Um, right. Um, and then women will come in and they'll do the same thing. And they'll say, you know, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother, my sister, and my best friend. So they've told like one to three people maybe, right? And so even, right. even for them, they feel like they haven't really told anyone. We need to talk to one another. And now more than ever, we need to be able to talk to one another. And I don't mean that kind of like Instagram faux vulnerability of like, I've never told anyone this before, but I'm going to tell all my thousands of you know people on the internet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, that's so you, cheap. Yeah. 
right. Can you, when, it, when the stakes are the highest, which means the person matters to you, it's one-on-one -on -one with someone who matters to you and you look them in the eye and you're able to say, here's who I am without the mask. Here's what's going on for me. It is so liberating to be able to have those conversations because what I think we ultimately really want is when I have couples come in, they're not so much about like, I want to know that you love me. It's I want to know that you understand me. Oh, yes. We want to be understood. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you understand me? And that feeling of being understood connects us to everybody else. And so when we feel lonely, it's because we feel disconnected. So yes, I think we need to be able to talk to one another about who we really are, the truth of who we are, what we're really experiencing, and not like the TMI, which is sort of the curated version of vulnerability, but just really showing up and, sh and being able to show up for somebody else. One skill that I think we really don't, we don't get a lot of information about when we're growing up of how to be a good listener. What does it mean to listen? Listening isn't just about the words the, the person is saying. Listening is about connecting with the emotions underneath the words. I like to say that in therapy, I'm listening for the music under the lyrics. And I think that we need to do that when we're listening to the people that we love. What is the music under the lyrics? And then we will feel so much more connected to one another, especially during this time when we feel so isolated. Yeah. I was going to say, I have two things to that. I have a couple, um, this group of eight girlfriends that I've known since, some since second grade, but some since high school from Spokane, where I'm from. And we've been doing a cocktail hour on Saturdays at five o'clock, um, Zoom cocktail hour. It has become so meaningful to me. And, you know, because we're, maybe because of how Zoom works, but people are really revealing deep things about themselves. And we always end with what, what we're appreciative about. And um, I wouldn't think I would, it would seem too hokey to me, you know, the former me, but during this pandemic, it's become an incredibly meaningful experience. Also, just on a funny note, yesterday, my husband said, you expend so much attentiveness and empathy when I'm telling you something that you don't give any bandwidth to remembering what I said after it's over. It's true. Like, oh, uh -huh. mm. Then a minute later, what? Okay, here we are. Um, next question. Can you describe what an ideal first session with a therapist looks like? What questions should a patient ask to determine if it's a good fit? Yeah, again, it's that's sort of like saying what quality, you know, what are the questions you should ask on a first date and what are the qualities you should look for in a partner? I think that's going to be highly idiosyncratic. So what is, you know, for example, someone might go to a therapist and that therapist is a fantastic match for them, but it's not a good match for maybe the next person. Right. right. So it, it's highly personal. So there aren't a set of questions. I think, again, it's about how do you feel when you're sitting and talking to this person? Do you feel good when you're talking? To, I don't, when I say good, that's such a generic term. What I mean is, do you feel like this person is easy to talk to? Do you feel like you trust this person? And again, trust is a process. But so um, do you feel like this is someone who um, kind of gets you and gets what you're talking about? Yeah. It's it's very, it's very much, it's not on like a cognitive level, what, how you, it's like in your heart, it's on this level. How do you feel in the room while you're talking to this person? And do you want to talk to this person for another 50 minutes? Do you want to go on a second date? That's really what it's about. And if you think the person, I always think, can the person get you and be generally on your side? Are they able to be? And can they challenge you? Can, do you think they have the capacity? Well, I, can I challenge you? Yes, that, that's the one thing that I forgot to mention, which is, um, you know, I think that we walk this line as therapists between wanting people to see something that's going to really be helpful to them, but also not doing it at the wrong time, not doing it too soon when their defenses will get even higher. I was right. a competitive chess player growing up. And to me, I'm always thinking about like, if I make this move, then they might make this move. But if they make that move, then I'm going to have to adjust my moves. You have to be very strategic as a therapist and also be very real in the room. So you're, there's the right. strategy part and you're combining both. So when you're going in for a first session, your therapist might challenge you once during that session, you know, depending on where you are, if you're coming in and you're really in crisis, they're probably not going to challenge you at all because right. that's not the moment. Um, but if you're coming in and you're really curious about yourself, they might ask you one question that got you really thinking about something in a different way. 
And that's a good sign because that means that the therapist is going to help you see something that maybe you're not seeing out there. Um, you know, but, but it depends on what's going on in the session. Sometimes I won't challenge someone in that first session because I don't think they're ready or I think that they're going to take umbrage at it, you know? So right. I, I really have to gauge what's going on in the room. Yeah. Okay. Lori, what's the best way to grieve the loss of a loved one while stuck at home? Did you hear that one? So you, you kind of froze for a second. What's the oh, okay. best way to grieve? Um, you didn't hear. Yeah, what's the best way to grieve the loss of a loved one while stuck at home? Did you hear that? Are we breaking up? You kind of to grieve the loss of, sorry, to grieve the loss of a loved one during the pandemic. Is that what you said? Yeah. Like where you're yes. stuck at home. Oh yeah. You know, oh, so I have some personal experience with this, which is that my father died last month, not of the coronavirus. Um, he had congestive heart oh. failure, but we weren't expecting him. We were, he was, we knew he was going to die in the next several months. We didn't know when it would be. Um, and it was this very surreal experience because um, we couldn't have a funeral. You couldn't, you know, like we could have a private burial. We couldn't have in what the tradition for me is we would sit Shiva. So for seven days, people would be coming in your house constantly, right. bringing food, hugging you, um, you know, sharing memories, um, just their presence is what's so important. And so I think for, you know, what I, I really feel for people who have lost people either because of the coronavirus or just unrelatedly, um, mm -hmm. I felt like I almost couldn't bring it up because it wasn't about the coronavirus and all anybody was talking about was the coronavirus. And my father was 85 years old and he was already ill. And, and yet, you know, it went against everything that I write about, which is that there's no hierarchy of grief. This isn't the grief Olympics. You know, people are experiencing losses of all kinds right now. And every loss matters and every loss um, is important to be able to talk about with other people and not have people minimize it or compare it and say, well, it's not like this happened to you. It's not like you lost an eight year old child or it's, you know, it's like, right. there's no yeah. hierarchy here. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's really important that to be able to grieve and to be able to share with people what your loss is and how it's impacted you. And just to be able to, to talk about it again, going back to maybe we should talk to someone, right. Mm -hmm. Um, that we all need to be able to talk about what we're experiencing. And I think it's really hard to feel like you don't have the normal rituals in place of what would happen in terms of how you would have the company of others to help you get through this grieving. And I would say get through this grieving process. We don't really get through it. We move forward in it. But I think, you know, yeah. there's, there's this myth about grief that like you get through it and one day you're done. Okay. It's like, you're not. Um, I think that it's a sign of how much you felt loved by this person and how much you love this person that they're always, the grief is always going to live inside you in some way. It's just going to take a different shape over time. I'm so sorry about your dad. And I'm thinking of the part in your book where he tells you how proud he is of you. And I'm glad yeah. for him that he did that. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Next question. Um, do you see a role for remote therapy going forward, even after things go back to quote unquote normal? Yeah, so I had always been staunchly opposed to this kind of online therapy um, for all the reasons that I mentioned before. Um, you know, but, but I do. I mean, I think that it makes it more accessible for some people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think anything can replace the in-person experience. I just, I, I think it's its own thing, but I think it's a different experience. And for some people, it might be a useful experience if they're not interested in or able to have the in-person experience. I do see it very differently now. I see it in a much more positive light than I had. Yeah, I feel that way too. Um, there's things I didn't expect, like even the TED conference that I was supposed to go to this year, they did a little pre-thing. And I thought, oh, this is going to be awful. No, it was, it was actually great. And it felt really immediate. And I'm, I'm actually impressed with how we can move into a more virtual world. Okay. Right. Well, what is, I think it's shown how, you know, we talk so much about all that we've lost, but I think that people need to notice what they're doing well during this time. So I think that so yeah. many people are so resilient. They're so adaptable and flexible. And I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for how well we're doing. If you had said to us, like, you said to me months ago, you're going to be um, 
in your home. You're not going to go to work every day. You're going to, the only places you can go are the grocery store and the pharmacy. And if you go out, everyone's going to be masked. So if they smile, you don't even know if anyone's smiling at you. Um, you know, your kid's going to be home from school doing remote learning and your father's going to die. I would have said, I don't think I can cope with all that, but look at us. We're all coping and not only coping, we're doing remarkably well and we're finding ways to connect and to find the experiences, to find a version of the experiences that we normally have. And I think so many people are thriving in lots of ways, even as they're experiencing loss, anxiety, grief, all of those things. Yeah, I think so too. I'm actually amazed. At you. First of all, we're such social creatures. We're, we find the way to be social. Um, but also, um, because I happen just, I so happen to have studied the Black Death a lot. Um, I keep thinking that's only like 700 years ago <laughs> when it started in 1348, but uh, the Black Death in Europe, I should say. Um, but like, and so in 700 years is nothing in human history, but it, we're, do, we're handling this so much better. Like we've, we've really moved forward. Like if you really pull the lens back, it's amazing what humans are doing now. Okay. Um, loved the book. It helped. Getting a divorce after 28 years, not my choice. And isolation that maybe weren't there in our notification-filled world. Okay, wait. How did this have so many? Oh, wait. No, no. Here's a rewritten one. Okay, love the book. It helped. Getting a divorce after 20 years, not my choice. Being held up by pandemic. What is the way to crawl out of this grief? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I I, mor I morphed two questions together. That's why it came out garbled the first time. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think that so many people. So I also write the Dear Therapist column for the Atlantic, um, which comes out every Monday. You're and everywhere. I also <laughs> well, no, I get what I'm saying is I get. So I have, and I'm launching this new podcast called Dear Therapist um, that Katie Kirk's producing for iHeart anybody has any questions, you can write to Lori and Guy at iHeartMedia.com. And um, I'm getting so many questions about this kind of thing, which is like, people are experiencing a breakup during the pandemic, or people are getting divorced, and or they got divorced, and now they're sort of, it, it's very fresh and very new. And, um, you know, how do they cope during this time? And that's such an important question, because I think that, you know, we talk so much about isolation during this time, I think that word is, you know, when we talk about the stories and the words that we use that we were talking about earlier in terms of like the ways that we narrate our lives and how that can really have an impact, we aren't actually isolated. Like all you do is you pick up your phone and you can see, not only talk to, but actually see and chat with um, somebody anywhere in the world, basically, right? If they have a phone and an internet connection. So, um, so I feel like a lot of people feel like they're very isolated. And I see that with single people right now or people who are newly divorced or people who have had a new breakup and they feel like, well, I don't want to bother my friends who are like, you know, have a partner or have kids because they have so much on their plates and they're so busy. And what I'm hearing from the people in families like that is, oh my God, I hear the same stories every day, the same jokes, the same irritating habits. I love these people, but being around them 24 seven is really hard. I wish somebody would call me, right? And so I tell the single people, reach out to those people. They are dying to hear from you. It is nourishing for them. It's nourishing for you. I feel like a lot of people, when they get out of a relationship, they feel like they're a burden on other people. Mm -hmm. um, they feel like no one wants to hear from me. And what, they want to hear from you. And even if you're, you know, want to talk about your divorce, you want to talk about your breakup, they're interested in something other than themselves right now. So I really want people to not hesitate about reaching out. Um, people generally will very much welcome um, your presence and, and you will welcome theirs. And it's a nice distraction from your own world if you can hear about their worlds too. Right. I always think your problems make other people feel better about themselves. It's your <laughs> gift. It's your gift to give. Okay. Um, what opportunities do you see for people finding happiness and meaning during the quarantine and isolation that maybe weren't there in our notification filled world? So many people are afraid to talk about this because they feel like, how can I experience them? Right? Okay. Well, good for you then. That's great. Because a lot of people, a lot of people feel like there's something inappropriate about talking about 
the ways that they feel really good or the ways that they're growing, um, the, the joy that they're experiencing. That's why in the New York Times piece that I had come out today, I was talking about how important it is for us to be able to laugh and for the laughter to sit alongside the pain and the grief and whatever else might be going on. And so I feel like, um, you know, a lot of people are really in this time when they don't have all the hustle and bustle and everything going on around them, they're, they're hearing themselves think differently. They're, they're listening to themselves. Um, you know, a lot of people who are complaining so much about isolation are actually complaining about, uh, they're equally complaining about, they don't have enough privacy, like there's too much in their households. And I say to people, Tell people in your households that you need isolation, you need privacy, you need an hour to yourself to just hear yourself think, to process sort of what's going on for you, to, to have some time to ourselves. There's a difference between loneliness and solitude. Loneliness is, is being alone and feeling empty. Solitude is being alone and feeling full. And so I think that in for the people who can experience solitude right now, they're really growing and changing and they're experiencing joy in a different way. They're slowing down a little bit. They're reading, they're, they're grabbing the, the art supplies from the closet, um, whatever their, their interests or hobbies where they're playing an instrument again. Um, they're coming up with an idea for a new company. They are, you know, like all of a sudden there's this space that was taken up by all this noise. And what people I think can take away from this as we start to emerge from this, whatever that is going to look like, is that maybe some of that noise isn't necessary. That maybe some of that noise we don't need to bring back into our lives when we go back to quote unquote normalcy. That maybe normalcy can look different in a really positive way. And so I think that those, those small transformations that people are making right now can lead to big transformations as things start to normalize and people get to define for themselves what is their normal going to look like from now on? What is meaningful to them? Who and what are meaningful to them? And who and what do they want to, to give time to and prioritize? And who and what do they want to not give so much time to, not give so much emotional real estate to in the future? Yeah, I, I mean except for all the pain and suffering and all the future pain and suffering and the whole debacle of our current national response to it, all those terrible things. Um, I'm so excited for the world to get this time because I think the creativity and the art and the realignment with more meaningful values is going to be transformative after this for the whole world. I, I actually, I mean, I might be sort of a Pollyanna about it, but I, I mean, for me, it's been a transformative experience completely positively. I am on social media less. I'm on Twitter less. I'm on, I'm actually, I'm like having a nap in the afternoon and waking up and reading for a couple of hours. I'm, I mean, it's like, it's the whole, it felt like, it feels like the ship is getting righted in this way that will have long-term effects that are, I can't see as anything but positive. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy for the world to get a break from itself, like <laughs> that it can just go and think. And, and I know that's not true for everyone, but there it is for a lot of people. And we have, well, to I think, it. yeah, I mean, I, I think what is true though, is that, you know, my whole book, again, not knowing that we were going to end up in this situation <laughs> is about how we grow in connection with others. Right. And and, and part of that is connection to self, right? And part of that is, is, connect, is how important those, those relationships are in our lives, um, whatever those relationships are. I don't mean just romantic relationships. I mean, friendships and family relationships and um, work relationships. I think that the intimacy of seeing inside our coworkers' homes and being able to say like, oh, tell me about your kids that I've never even asked about, right? right. Or right, tell me about, oh, I didn't know you had that hobby that I'm now seeing in the background. Tell me about that. Um, I think that because we feel it's so important, even when, if you take a walk in your neighborhood, right. And everyone's yeah. like gloves on and it's so bizarre and yet everyone's so friendly to one another because all of a sudden we appreciate these yeah. connections and we realize how important they are in our lives. So I think we really do grow in connection with others. And that's why everyone's saying, oh, your book is so relevant now during the pandemic, who knew? But I think I was writing about something profound about the human condition that we are all now taking the time to say, yes, this is important to me. Right. This is important to all of us. And we are all connected and we are all more the same than we are different. That I think we spend so much time talking about how different we are and everybody's arguing about their differences. Right. We're so the same at our core. 
And, and I think that's really the lesson of the book and the lesson of, of this experience that we're all going through right now. Yeah, I feel so much more connected to my neighbors who I'm yelling across the fence to now. And I also feel like, man, I really just want to have maybe whatever, 10 people that I'm really close to for a lifetime rather than 200 people that I'm constantly trying to keep up with. I'm hoping I can really make that change. That's been a good thing out of this. Okay. Um, what do you believe is the most common inhibitor to successful therapy? Ooh. Well, so we were talking before about how to find a therapist and every study, you know, you'll find study after study about how the most important factor in the success of your therapy is your relationship with your therapist. It matters more than the therapist training. It matters more than their years of experience. It matters more than the modality that they're using. And I don't mean that none of those things is important. All of those things are important but they're not as important as the relationship with the therapist. And so um, that's why it's really important that if you feel like you're not with the right person to bring that up in therapy with your therapist, <gasps> not, I know, right? You cringe, you, you cringe when you hear that. Um, that experience alone is so valuable. Um, you know, if people bring that up to me, I welcome that conversation. And sometimes there's something going on with them that has made something happen in the relationship where they don't feel connected and we work through it. And it's been an amazing experience for them. And sometimes I'm just not the right person for that person. Right. And I am happy to get them to a person who is a better fit for them. We want you to feel better. We want you to, um, you know, have a better experience in your own life. And if you're not having a good experience in therapy, you're not going to have a good experience out in the world. So okay. I think that, you know, that's going to be the most important thing in terms of measuring what is going to matter the most. Yeah. Okay. Now I have to just tell one bad therapist story. I had a therapist once I'd been going for like four months and she I came in and she said, you never asked me about me. I just went on a trip to Chicago and, and I want to show you my pictures from my trip. Did you have the licensing board on speed dial? I said, well, oh, of course I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I never asked about you. Oh my God. And then she sat next to me and showed me pictures of her trip to Chicago. Let me tell you, let me, let me tell you. So first of all, I, I hope that person is not practicing anymore, but let me tell you. Um, something that does prevent people from, from getting the most out of therapy, which is when they're not truthful. And what I mean is that not that people necessarily come in and lie. And I talk about this in the TED Talk, which is that yeah. they're telling the story in a particular way because they want right. me to agree with them. They want me to validate their version of the story. Mm -hmm. um, they want to look good. And, and it's, not, it's not something that they're very aware of. I think we all do that, right? We tell a story in the way that feels true to our experience, but they're missing entire portions of the story in terms of what they emphasize and what they minimize and what they right. leave in, they leave out and who the main characters are and who the supporting characters yeah. are. Do the supporting characters matter? Or are they a distraction from what we really need to be talking about or what the crux of the story really is? So I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm an editor in that room yeah. and my writing comes in really handy because um, you know, I'm helping them to edit their stories. And sometimes when people are really reluctant to edit their stories, um, it becomes really hard. So what they do is they're kind of like, they come in, they tell an anecdote and they're like, then they go off on another tangent. And I'm trying to figure out, like, they're going like, look over here, look over here, look over here. Right. And I'm looking everywhere and I'm thinking to myself, what is the significance of the stories they're telling me? Why did they choose these stories? Is there do the plot points reveal a theme? Is there a common thread here? And if not, I'm wondering what they're not telling me. I'm wondering what are we not talking about that we should be talking about? So if you are going to therapy and you, you have the mask on, um, you're not going to really get much out of that experience. It's, it's my responsibility as a therapist to help you notice that, but it's, right. I can't make you take the mask off. I can create the conditions yeah. that are most conducive for you to take the mask off, but ultimately it's your choice of how you're going to use the therapy. Yeah. I feel like the right, I mean, I was, I behaved in a bad way in that situation. I thought in my head, like, I'm like, I'm going to break up with you, but not right away so that you don't think it's about this moment. And, um, and then I'm going to go to another, you know, six weeks of therapy and then I'm going to say I'm done. But 
this is why and I'm never going to tell you that now I like to think now I could say that but at that time yeah. many years ago I did I, I wasn't able to do that anyway okay here we go. Did you have a vulnerability hangover after publishing this book? <laughs> if so, how did you move through it? That's a great, that's a great question. I love that phrase. Um, so what's really funny about this book is that, so if you read the book, you find out I, I had written this piece about parenting that, that like went viral, that everybody, it was called How to Land Your Kid in Therapy and everybody wanted me to write that book and I turned down that book and then I, I was doing this happiness book that I was that was making me miserable and my agent at the time and I'll emphasize at the great. time <laughs> said like you'll never write another book again if you don't write this and so um I ended up um you know canceling the happiness book to write this book that everyone said like no one's gonna read like no one's gonna read this book it's like it's it's not a big commercial book and so everyone <laughs> You know, so I thought I'm writing this book for the three people who will read it. And I hope it's useful because I feel like this is the book that really needs to get out there. And I only wanted to do something that felt meaningful. I didn't yeah. want to just write a book for the sake of writing a book and having this commercial success that meant nothing. So I said, I will do the book that no one's going to read, but you know, at least it, it, it feels consistent with my values and what I want to put out there and what I want to say. And so I just let it rip because I was like, no one's going to read this book. I don't really care. I don't have to clean myself up. Right. Right. And then I turned it into the publisher and they were so excited about this book and they were passing it around and everyone oh sharing God. it. And all of a sudden I had this sort of, you know, I was sort of mortified. I was like, wow, there's so much in there. That's really, that feels really, really vulnerable. And, um, you know, maybe 30 people will read this book or 300 people will read this book now. <laughs> And, and, you know, maybe I, maybe I should kind of, there are certain sections that maybe I should kind of finesse a little bit and not be so authentic and, you know, like, let's clean them up a little bit. Um, and, and I didn't, and I'm really glad that I didn't, because I feel like the reason that so many people are reading the book, I mean, it's a year out and it's still on the New York times list. And I feel like the reason that so many people have read the book and continue to read it is because they relate to the people in the book. There are four patients in the book that I follow as a clinician, but the fifth patient in the book is me. And I'm a real patient in the book. I'm not like some, some glorified version of a patient. I'm just me going through a really difficult period in my life. And I do the same things with my therapist that my patients do with me. I do hide. I do have the mask on. It takes me a very long time to reveal a few things about my life that I'm not willing to talk about at the right. beginning. Um, you know, and I, I Google stalked him one night and I don't tell him that I Google stalked him. And then I'm editing myself in the therapy room. And I know that my patients Google me because they always slip up the way that I slipped up, you know, kind of. In, right. in I love that part. And then you have to reveal it. I love it. <laughs> right. And so, and so I thought that was really important. I think that's what people relate to is they relate to being able to see themselves in the, in, in the authenticity of other people's stories. So I'm really glad that I didn't know. It's kind of like childbirth. It's like, you're really glad that you didn't know what it was going to be, or maybe you wouldn't have done it. Um, right. you know, like, right. it was gonna be. Um, it's kind of like, I'm really glad I didn't know how many people were going to read that book because I, I maybe would have hesitated to reveal yeah. myself that I did. Yeah. Well, I, and I struggle with that too, because I do these personal shows and I, and people will say, oh my God, you reveal so much. And then part of me is like, well, I don't reveal everything. I mean, I, I am crafting a story, <laughs> you know, like, um, but I just got used to it, you know, like, and it is hard sometimes and embarrassing a lot of times, but I think um, the benefit of doing that by being able to connect with others is worth it. And I think that's what you did. So I thank you for that book. And I know we're out of time now. We could go on for hours. Well um, Wow. Well, you know, I, I, I'm so glad we got to have this conversation Me because like, as you write so much about yourself. I've been a fan of yours for decades. Yeah, thank you. And no, I mean, this is like a dream come true to have this conversation with you. So I, I'm oh, so Lord. excited. Today. Okay. To many more conversations and we are done. Thanks guys. <laughs> Hi again, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our first South by Southwest online session. And a big thank you to Lori and Julia again for taking the time to come and speak with us, for sharing their stories and answers with us today. We re really, really hope you all enjoyed your time with us this week. As a reminder, on Tuesday, May 5th, we will have our next South by Southwest online session with futurist Amy Webb. 
In the meantime, you can also keep up with us on social media at SXSW. If you're looking for more content from us as well, subscribe to our podcast available on all major platforms. Thank you again for watching. We hope you can join us next week. See you later. <laughs>